herzlich willkommen auf der Media Convention 2016. Ich bin Anja Zimmer, die Direktorin der Medienanstalt Berlin-Brandenburg und ich freue mich, Sie heute hier auf unserer Bühne begrüßen zu dürfen. Wir sind das erste Mal... Ich bin das erste Mal in dieser Funktion hier und freue mich sehr, dass wir zwei Tage gestalten, zusammen mit unseren Einrichtungen, dem Alex Berlin und dem MIZ in Babelsberg. Wir präsentieren Ihnen in den nächsten zwei Tagen das, was uns in unserer täglichen Arbeit bewegt. Wir wollen sprechen über Vielfalt im Digitalen und wie man sie sicherstellen kann. Wir wollen sprechen über Medienkompetenz und wir wollen sprechen über Innovation. Was heißt das konkret? Zunächst wird Mark Little von Twitter Vice President Media für Europa und Afrika, uns erzählen, was Twitter für Storytelling macht und wie es weitergehen wird. Wir werden dann EU-Kommissar Günther Oettinger begrüßen, der uns wissen lässt, was die EU im Digitalen so plant, der aber auch über das Thema Netzneutralität mit uns sprechen wird und darüber, was das eigentlich bedeutet. Im Anschluss, und darüber freue ich mich sehr, kommt Frau von Schewig von Stanford, eine echte Expertin im Thema Netzneutralität, die die Frage stellt, ob wir Netzneutralität in Europa so überhaupt noch sicherstellen können. Morgen früh wird Bertram Gugel mit uns darüber sprechen, wie YouTube sich verändert. Was passiert, wenn immer mehr Medienunternehmen in YouTube als Producer auftreten? Wir werden diskutieren darüber, wie Influencer in sozialen Netzwerken tätig sind und was man braucht, um zu verstehen, wann wir über Werbung und wann wir über Programm sprechen. Ganz besonders freue ich mich, dass das MIZ in einem Rapid-Fire-Pitch in fünf Minuten neun ihrer aktuellen Innovationsprojekte vorstellt. Ich bin sicher, das wird super spannend. Wir sprechen dann mit Bild-Chefredakteur Julian Reichelt über die Frage, welche Bilder im Netz gezeigt werden dürfen, wann Bilder verboten werden müssen. Er spricht mit Andreas Frischer von der KJM. So, und am Ende werden wir mit Joachim Huber zusammenfassen, welche Verpflichtungen, welche Regularien, welche, welche Impulse haben wir in zwei Tagen gewonnen, was heißt das für die Politik, was heißt das für Regulierer, was heißt das für die Medienwirtschaft. Ich möchte jetzt aber nicht langweilen, Sie werden sicherlich zu all diesen Veranstaltungen kommen, da bin ich mir ganz, ganz sicher und ich hoffe, dass Sie die Zeit nutzen, um Neues zu hören, um gute Kontakte zu knüpfen und vor allem, um ganz, ganz, ganz viel Spaß zu haben. In dem Sinne, ach, was ich noch vergessen habe, wenn Sie es nicht schaffen, die eine oder andere Veranstaltung zu hören, kein Problem, Alex Berlin streamt die Veranstaltungen und die können Sie danach auf unserem YouTube-Channel anhören. Jetzt aber in diesem Sinne herzlich willkommen, Mark Little von Twitter. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for turning out such numbers. Uh, my apologies in advance for speaking uh, in English. I'll try to keep it to about 140 characters uh, each sentence. But uh, it's a real privilege to be here today. I know that Republica celebrates its 10th birthday. Happy birthday. Twitter also this year celebrated its 10th birthday. And I think there's something almost poetic in this, because I always feel like Twitter is a movement. It's not necessarily just a technology platform. I see Republica as a movement. Just think about the 10 years that have defined storytelling, which is what I want to talk about today, because we're journalists, we're activists, we're developers, but in essence, we are telling the story of now in ways that we could only dream about 20 years ago. And so when I think of Twitter, um, it's a great privilege to speak on behalf of Twitter because I've actually only been with the company as an employee for five months. But I kind of fell in love with Twitter before it was invented. Um, I've been a storyteller all my life. Uh, you may not hear it from the accent, but I'm Irish. And if anybody has been to Ireland, you'll know that for us, storytelling is like competitive sport. Um, it's like other nations, they take care of their national teams. We always want to be the first with a story. And there's this moment in Ireland when you tell a story, and it's about the, the time it takes to order a pint in which you've got about 20 or 30 seconds to make an impact, to grab people's attention, to persuade them you have something to say that matters. And so for me, growing up in that environment, along came Twitter, and it, in many ways, just embodied that sense of engagement, that compelling story. And so when I see as a professional storyteller as well, what Twitter has meant 
over the past 10 years, I remember the moments that are now iconic. The moment something happened, and around that moment, a story emerged. And people listening to the story, but they became the storytellers themselves. They created movements. So every time I see an event taking place on Twitter, I think about that concept. That Twitter is so unique because it is three words. It's live and it's public and it's all about engagement. And as we've celebrated 10 years inside Twitter, we've understood what makes this platform unique. It is live, it is public, and it's all about engagement. And that's something I think when you compare, even at the rapid development of the social web, it still makes Twitter unique. Now, I, I stand here as someone who doesn't just repeat that because I hear it inside my company. I stand here because Twitter, it changed my life. Um, it's not too, um, I'll, I'll be sort of saying, what I mean by changing my life is this was my life. I was a TV anchor in Ireland. I was the uh, anchor for the top-rated news show on RTE, the state broadcaster. I was also somebody who got to live my dream as a foreign correspondent. So for about 10 years, wherever there was war, wherever there was conflict or natural disaster, also where there were societies, this is Iran, this is me about 10 years ago, just before Twitter was invented, telling a story as a TV journalist from Esfahan. And I remember how difficult it was to really give that live public engagement with my audience because, as you can see, it's a difficult process to be a TV journalist and to be authentic and to be engaging. And then along came Twitter. And at the beginning, and I shouldn't say this, but I was a cynic because I thought that Twitter would replace me as a journalist. It would make sure that we would have no way of telling contextual, serious stories. But as I started to engage, Twitter made me a better journalist, certainly made me a better storyteller, because suddenly I had to listen to the audience. They could tell me things. They could tell me how shit I was. They could also tell me how I should ask different questions. They should tell me about people who knew more about the story than I did could suddenly talk to me in real time, and I became a better journalist. I also realized that there was a business here. What would happen if you started a news agency from scratch in the age of Twitter? What would it look like? And so I went ahead and created an organization called Storyful. And Storyful's job was to sort out the news from all the noise that goes on in social platforms, particularly Twitter. So I started from Ireland, tiny little company. We got to the point where we were working with all of the biggest publishers and broadcasters and social networks and brands. We sold a company about uh, two years ago to News Corporation, and I stuck with the company, and then I decided that I, uh, I wanted to leave. But what I had got in those three years was a really intimate understanding as somebody who had built a business on Twitter, someone whose live, life was changed by Twitter, of what it meant in practice. So going back to 2011, Storyful was one of the first companies to watch what was happening coming out of places like Tunisia and Egypt, watching the Arab Spring begin with a hashtag, Sidi Bouzid, the town where a fruit seller called Mohammed Bouazizi set himself on fire. It became a movement. And what I started to realize was it wasn't just about these young people being able to tell a story, but you remember the old days. You had to have a printing press or a satellite dish or a radio transmitter to reach a mass audience. Suddenly, in the right place, at the right time, with the right message, the right story, you could reach a mass audience. You could bypass everybody. And so, obviously, politicians caught on to this idea. This was obviously 2012, uh, a tweet and a photograph that broke the internet at that stage, Barack Obama, talking around traditional media. And at every moment, in every breaking news event, what we're seeing is something very, very new and unique. We're seeing pieces of content, creating conversations, and then creating communities. Just think about that. It's not just a single piece of content, it's a story which engages a conversation and out of every news event emerges these remarkable communities that are spontaneous, that are instant, that have no restrictions, no boundaries, no one telling you how that story should develop. And that's why I fell in love with Twitter. And that's the evolution that I've seen in the way we tell our stories of now. And what I want to just do for the next few minutes is look forward a bit. So we're all part of a movement, I think. The reason you're here today is because you care about the way we tell stories in our world today. You appreciate the freedoms that are coming 
with this revolution, but you're also understanding the challenges. And with Twitter, clearly, it's 10 years old. I have a 10 year old daughter, and I know what kind of challenges she faces. Well, Twitter's 10 years old, it faces challenges. But one of the things to remember about Twitter is its global reach. And so, you know, we talk about how many people come onto the app itself, about 300 odd million people. But remember, Twitter's unique because what we want to do is we want people to consume what we do on Twitter and what storytellers do on Twitter off the platform. So all told, if you take what, people come to the app, people come to the website, people search for profile clicks, Google search, you get an audience closer to about a billion people. Now something else happens when you think about the way Twitter's content spreads outside of its platform. I'll just give you an example. I always think this is fascinating. Do you remember the dress? I know you're probably bored at the time within about 25 seconds with this story, but remember, BuzzFeed dropped a single tweet onto Twitter about what color was that dress. And within... Batten down the hatches. Okay. Now time for the great debate, all right? This one has everyone asking, what color is this dress? So three hours later, what we have is that tweet, single tweet, goes outside of Twitter, starts sparking a conversation, which produces almost instantly about a million hits on BuzzFeed. This is Jonah Peretti, who you all know is regarded one of those people who has really rapidly innovated the concept of storytelling at scale, talking about that one tweet having essentially a, a million times the impact in terms of clicks. And that's typical of what happens at Twitter, where you have page views coming from the single tweet. And it's not just about this idea of scale, it's about the idea of influence. A network exists within Twitter to take these stories in that moment and then amplify them way beyond Twitter itself. We also see something interesting happening in the way that we all consume live events. You're watching a football game. You know what you're doing. You're probably there in your social, your, your social network and your, your device. You're probably on Twitter and you're talking in real time. And what suddenly happens is Twitter becomes this parallel world that you live in as you watch this first screen. And it's instant again, because the vast majority of people are watching on their mobile device. They're consuming and they're tweeting in real time as the event happens. And so suddenly what we have, and this is a, I love to study, this is, uh, we watch people in the UK through a consultancy. We watch what they were doing as they were consuming uh, a live broadcast and what they were doing on their mobile devices. And we saw that essentially there is no difference. These two things in the real world today are happening now. So the content is almost not as important, again, as the conversation. And what we looked at in a separate study was what happens when you've got Twitter and you're talking with your community on it and you're also watching this live event. And what we found was if you're watching with Twitter, you're doubling the emotional impact of that conversation and that live event. And so we start to know that we're not talking just about scale. We're talking about the intensity of engagement. We're talking about the emotional connection that you have to another individual, to a community. And that, again, I think for me, is one of the reasons I'm still in love with Twitter and I look forward to what happens next. Video is the thing that the people who use our platform are telling us is critically important going forward. There were 220 times as much video consumed last December as there were the previous December on Twitter. 93% of the views for those videos came from mobile devices, which is actually more than the general average for Twitter. We're about 80% consumed on mobile. What's next? It's my big Star Wars moment. It's live video. It's just another form of what we already do, live public engagement around video content. That's what's driving in many ways the evolution of the story of now on Twitter. For me, if anything embodies the spirit of Twitter in this 10th year, it's Periscope, because it actually reminds me of what Twitter was in the early days. I don't know if you remember, some of you, as a journalist, I was told, don't go on Twitter. You know, it's, it's like, it's dangerous. It's lawless. It's, it's out, out of control. And I love that about Twitter. And the same thing now with people using Periscope to kind of break the rules of traditional broadcasting, to bring you to the scene, for example, in this case, of the Paris attacks and their immediate aftermath, to take you as a journalist, and believe me, this is so new and innovative, take my audience with me in a way that they can experience reality, truth. They can see it for themselves and they can ask you as a journalist a question. And obviously with the Paris attacks, we saw the nature of Periscope where you could plot it, you could see it in, in physical terms, in terms of mapping. And at that moment, because you were discovered, 
you could get a bigger reach and a bigger audience. But the one thing for me as a journalist that Periscope always drives home to me is, so I remember being in Kandahar. I don't know if you know this place. It's in southern Afghanistan. It's the birthplace of the Taliban. And I was there in 2006, I think it was, before Twitter was invented. And I remember standing there, and I was kind of in a guest house, and I could hardly get out because I had to bring armed security guards to transport me out in the streets. And I may have about 20 minutes before I had to go back inside the compound. And I remember going with uh, a police officer. It was a woman police officer, most senior police officer in Afghanistan. And she protected women in the community against domestic abuse. And I remember going out with her for about an hour and a half, and uh, she was killed about three weeks after I was with her in that car. And I just remember to myself, wanting so badly to have a way for me to have some instant way of telling her story and to get people from my audience to come into the car with me and ask her questions, to know what was going on in the area. I could only dream of what people like Paul Ronsheimer have done. Award-winning periscopes, tracking the movement of refugees from Syria across borders, across oceans. Now, for me, as somebody who strove and, and who waited four or five days to get my stories back to a satellite dish to an audience who really passively consumed, this is absolutely revolutionary, and it's a year old. And so we're at the beginning here, clearly, with Periscope, with live streaming. We know there's a lot of activity out there. For us, what guides us going forward is constant innovation. In the creative power of Periscope, this is, for example, we have GoPro integration, so Someone's skiing down a hill, they can now put a GoPro camera, and they're now live going down the ski slope. Every week, we're shipping new creative tools on Periscope. And what we're really focused on is one thing is about discovering the best content and broadcasts, that beauty to know that you could find that person somewhere like Kandahar immediately. So discoverability will be part of what we're working on right now. I'm very excited about what's coming in the next weeks and months as we innovate. I'm just going to leave with uh, something that I care about uh, as, a, as a startup guy. So I think also about why I joined Twitter. And I know I joined Twitter because I want to do inside this company what I did outside. So I built a business on Twitter. I want to help news organizations build a business model on Twitter that gives them control of their own destiny. I want to help build independent and successful businesses on Twitter who care and value as much what they get on our platform as what they can take and put on their own sites. And so with my background, I kind of understand Twitter and the news organizations and businesses in four ways, discovery, curation, engagement, and publishing. And just to go through them very quickly, what I mean by discover is if you're a journalist and you want to find out in that news event at seconds old, how do I get to the best piece of content? And you probably all know if you're professional storytellers, TweetDeck, which essentially allows you to monitor sources in real time. And every week, I, I met these guys who designed this platform, and it's been the most important tool I ever used in my professional career. And I get to work with them now, and, and every week, again, innovating small features, uh, you know, signing in from Twitter and TweetDeck, saves you time if you could do it together. They've introduced those features. If you haven't used it in a while, go back and check out the new features, the new filters for location, content style. We're also looking at curation being so important, and TweetDeck plays a role in this. What I mean by curation is you find a piece of content. On its own, that's not value, valuable. What's valuable is you as a storyteller getting the content, explaining the context, why it's relevant, and building rich stories. And that's where, you know, in Twitter, we're looking at this. TweetDeck is part of it. But we're looking at moments, and moments as you probably have seen, if you've seen it at all, is all about the idea of reimagining the way stories might be consumed on Twitter. You know, not chronological in single tweets, but together in collections. We've had about only, I think now, six to eight months experimenting. We've already discovered so much about what happens to people's behavior when they see these rich collections and how they consume them. It's not the way you predict. And now, with the help of publisher partners, we're rolling out moments on an even greater scale. And I really, again, I'm so excited about what comes next with this tool that I hope you all will have some connection with in the months and years to come. And so finally, our second last thing I'd say about engagement is we know that at the moment there is this rich engagement on Twitter. We want to help news organizations, particularly professional storytellers, find real value. I don't know why I love this so much. Probably shouldn't, but um, 
We know so far that there are these kind of playful things on Twitter like GIFs that are now being used by professional storytellers to engage and, you know, tell a story in a thousand words in a single few seconds. And what we're doing, obviously, is we're innovating around these features to allow news organizations to, to poll their audiences, for example, which is really, we're showing massive engagement numbers uh, behind the scenes, searching for GIFs. I know I hate GIFs until I found GIF search. I haven't written an email, I don't think, without a GIF in it to say congratulations to anybody for about three weeks. Anyway, engaging, but more seriously, we're also seeing ways that we can help, for example, broadcasters take the live content they have and build tools for them to basically transfer it, edit, and then build experiences on Twitter that are almost instant but are very deeply engaging. And in this case, for example, this engagement we're seeing in live video, we also want to find ways to monetize the live video that you could create and bring to Twitter. That's something we're doing through the tool Amplify, another way we're looking to help build independent businesses. And the kind of like content that you can see, I mean, you all probably have seen this clip, but the idea of cutting the amount of time between you finding that piece of content and getting it to a community on Twitter is rapidly being reduced. And the value in that is starting to become more apparent. I'm going to finish off, I promise, my last point about this. Publishing. Remember what I said, we are probably unique in that we want you to take Twitter content and take it off platform. Why? Because our guarantee is to storytellers on Twitter that we will bring you the biggest possible audience, whether it's on Twitter, the app, or whether it's off in other people's sites, in other people's apps. That makes Twitter unique. A billion visitors come to the embedded tweets you see on sites every single month. I want more of that. And I want to see us helping publishers to increase the value they get from that unique thing that Twitter can offer. So when we look forward to 2016, um, we were at this leadership conference with Jack Dorsey, who's our founder and our CEO, which is great to have that person who understands the soul of the product. We set out these five priorities for this year. Refine an iconic product. What we mean by that is, if anybody here has ever started a, star started a company who believes in innovation, you know innovation doesn't mean inventing some great big revolutionary change. Innovation is about these small incremental changes that make your product better. Every week, we're shipping some of these incremental changes that are adding up in the figures we're seeing to a tremendous surge in engagement. Live video, I've talked about. Safety. The idea of building tools for the users of the platform to protect themselves against those who would use the social web to spread hate and abuse. Creators. This, again, is the core. Helping the people who tell stories on Twitter reach the biggest possible audience. That's what the media department does inside Twitter. And finally, helping developers who are building great experiences for storytelling. For example, we have the Fabric Toolkit. It's free, a couple of lines of code, is helping developers build mobile experiences and giving them the tools to monetize as well. So if you haven't checked out Fabric, your developer, a coder, take a look. But in all of this, this is where I leave it, when I think forward to Twitter for the next 10 years, and it's something that I've heard very much from Jack Dorsey, is the next 10 years, Twitter will be more Twitter. Because we know what we are. We know the value we bring. We know the evolution of storytelling in the now. Live public engagement. It's what defines us now. It's what will define us as we go forward. And as I leave you, I just want to leave you with this thought. Um, I turned up at conferences when I was outside of Twitter as a startup guy, and I remember looking at some person representing a technology company from Silicon Valley, and I would sort of look at them and I would be very, very cynical of what they said. I would also go to conferences with journalists as they talked about technology companies, and I realized there was this massive gap in understanding between the two. Every time a company, technology company, talks to storytellers, there's a, something lost in translation. I want you to leave today with one thought, that this is something we can't afford anymore. We can't afford as people who believe in this movement around storytelling to abandon dialogue between the platform and the people who tell the story. And I don't say that because I want to repeat some slogan. I don't. I've lived this. I know what it's like to be in the position you're in. I now know what it's like to be in an organization that's desperately seeking dialogue with the people who create the value. And so I would like to think, if you leave here today, you will understand that there is a dialogue possible with a platform that is totally aligned with the incentives and the interests of the storyteller, 
We want to give the storyteller the biggest possible audience. We want professional storytellers to build their own independent businesses. That's what I think makes us unique today. It's what I think will make us unique for the next 10 years. But it can only happen, I hope, if we can build a sort of dialogue that maybe begins today for some of you, but I hope will go on through your activities on this platform and what we can do together. Because the next 10 years, they can be as revolutionary as the last 10. I'm absolutely convinced of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know, do, do I have a couple of minutes for a question or may, have I run out of time? Have you turned? Oh, thank you very much, Mark Little. Thank you, thank you so yeah. much. We'll talk after, thank you. Maybe we have two or three minutes time yeah. for questions from the audience, two or three minutes. Are there questions? Nutzen Sie diese Chance. Der Europachef von Twitter ist hier im Haus. Ich glaube, da kommt ein Mikrofon. Bitte. Hi there. First of all, thank you very much for your very enthusiastic speech. Um, actually, even without you saying that you fell in love with Twitter, we could hear it all. Uh, so that's very interesting to see that you are so much really in love with it. Um, when you talk about storytelling, um, have you as well in mind that there's people, just private ones like myself, not being a journalist or something, but just really someone who likes to be in contact with other people? And What's, what's your view on Twitter for those people? Because what I hear is, and what we know, is that Twitter will change a little bit the style of how we get the tweets, like not only in chronological view, but um, as you said yourself, like in collections. Um, when I speak to my friends and my community, I could see at least that they don't like the idea of having this in collections. They want to see it in a chronological way. Um, is there a chance that we can stay this way and can, that we can see what happened during the day? Or is there, any other views? I think you speak to one of the greatest challenges for Twitter, right? So we know that we want to welcome people to the platform and make it simple for them. We want to make them engaged. We want to make sure the distance between them and the people they care about listening to is as short as possible. Clearly, for the people who are, we call them, that's so you call them power users, let's say, people who come to it every day because they're already in love with the platform, but they want to get quickly to the sources that they already have uh, followed. That's going to be the biggest challenge for us, is to make sure that the features we introduce for the people who've just come for a fairly simple experience are not going to interfere with the preferences, and I think more importantly, the interests of the people you're talking about. In all of what we do, the, the really important thing for us is to understand where something may endanger your experience, is to give you the choice to opt out. So there may be things you don't like, may irritate you. We've done some of that stuff, and to be honest, the engagement rates that have come from people who have engaged because of small changes we've made have been quite enormous, I have to say to you. But the key is for us, if we think something will damage your experience as an influencer, a creator, a storyteller, we want to give you the ability to opt out, to take the choice, to have one experience or the other. It's one of the reasons we have TweetDeck, to allow you to opt into something that's almost a turbocharged Twitter. And I think these are the things going forward that we keep very much in mind. We have to make this platform simpler. If you're a storyteller, we want you to get the biggest audience. The way we get a big audience is we make it easier for that big audience to feel like this is a place that every day, we want to go further. I want to make Twitter a feature of the lives of citizens of the great cities of Europe every day to check the transport system, you know, whatever they want to do, to, but their real lives. So we have a lot further to go here. But again, you're right, that's a key challenge. We won't minimize it. But we're always wait, looking for the way to give you the choice, the option, to change and toggle your experience between like direct messaging, let's say, public messaging. We're seeing that toggle being a very effective way of giving people choice. So that's what would inform it. Some things will be small, irritating, but as long as it doesn't interfere with the overall value you're getting, that, that will be the key thinking, and is the key thinking. Thank you.